Hey everyone, and welcome back to Evandale. This is a, a first time that I'm actually going to try streaming to Facebook on, on this page. Um, I have no idea if it's working right now, so <laughs> if you can, uh, just leave a nice little comment for me or something like that, and, uh, and, and let me know if you can hear me, and uh, video's okay, and blah, blah, blah. So let's get right into it. The world of Evandale has about 37 real years of history, and it has gone through an incredible number of uh, iterations of religion, of gods, and other things, from primordial dragons to uh, creation myths of varying kinds. But the more recent and the more stable one all starts off with the beings or being up to your interpretation of what we call the Tirsar. Um, the Tirsar are really these unsentient beings that just kind of exist, and their exact nature has never been described by any scholar within Evandale. And instead, uh, it is generally assumed that they don't even know that they exist, but these beings kind of dream. And so how that happens, that's really up to you to determine. But their dreams are all about infinite possibilities. Everything is possible at this beginning stage. Now, when this occurs, uh, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, just assume that it's about 14 and a half billion years ago and more beyond that. We're looking at the, uh, that's the beginning of the physical universe or so if we were to draw a correlation between uh, the universe of Evandale and our own. Um, so you can figure that roughly the physical universe is that, but the physical universe did not exist. Now, up on evandalerpg.com forward slash gods, or forward slash religion, forward slash gods, I believe. Hold on. Uh, where are you? Yeah, forward slash gods. evandalerpg.com forward slash gods. You will see a uh, uh, the introduction uh, to um, to the well, to the religion and the creation myth. And it all starts off with, before time or space, before the seas and mountains, the tears are dreamed of all things in all times. From their dreaming breath, which they called the Tiersarig, the old masters, that's actually what Tiersar means, is old masters, and that is said to be in the old Iberian language. The old masters fashioned Rishladel the dreamer, upon whose back would the messengers uh, would the messengers of the gods be burdened. Unto the great dream was Rishladel called by the silent thoughts of the old masters. For endless time did Rishladel listen in patience and collected in, into its mouth the many dreams, when no more was to be had. So we're talking infinity, Rishladel was able to hold. When no more was to be had, Rishladel spoke with a single utterance, all that the Tirsar had dreamt, and from this was made all that is possible. Risledel the dreamer then fashioned from its lips Valor, who had the ability to cause change. Um, in, uh, in tabletop RPG like D&D &D or Pathfinder or whatever you, or alignment-based uh, systems like this, this would be considered, Valor would be seen as, a, as an agent of entropy or chaos, uh, bringing constant change to something. Um, of course, chaos doesn't exactly mean evil. Chaos just simply means change. And now this was so because the lips can cause change. The sounds uh, can change the sounds of dreams and thoughts. That is why Valor was born out of the mouth, because lips can change things. Seemed okay when I wrote it. Valor caused the dreams to stir and boil in its great cauldron, and from within was born Kathos the weaver, who wove from the mixing Tiasareg, all the infinite dreams, a mighty tapestry whose many threads we uh, all must walk. Uh, these are the many threads that are the paths of fate. And so right there we establish within Evandale that all things are predetermined, and yet there's an infinite number of paths. So are things determined? Really up to you to decide as a, as a GM of this world. Kathos spread this tapestry before the Tirsar, who looked nowhere and in all directions of all time. From under the tapestry did Arios take shape, whose brilliant light shone upon all things, so all knowledge may be seen and known. Arios's bright gaze fell upon, Valor, fell upon Valor's cauldron and found within it a crack that leaked the boiling Tiasorig. Arios caused it to burn and turn to clay. From this was shaped balance, called Iparia, whose, uh, 
who was tasked to ensure the Tiesrig always flowed properly into Cathos's many hands. Iparia soon came to hold Valar's cauldron, for Iparia would never fall with its 500 hands, 1,000 legs, and twice that in feet. Valar looked down at Aparia, who held tight the crack closed and the cauldron steady. From Aparia did Valor take some of its many legs, and from them did he fashion a being, working into it the stuff of chaos. Arios looked at Valor's creation and watched it ooze and bend in all ways at once, but Arios's gaze was too mighty. The being stood in defiance and wrapped itself in a part of Cathos's mighty tapestry. This new being, called Serethid, was scorched by the Bright One's gaze. It turned it black, and as it drank deep of Arios's power and knowledge. This caused Arios to grow furious, and Serethid to know many more than others, but would always keep truth cloaked in darkness for those who would seek it by their own light. So right here, we've already established um, uh, two oppositions, uh, Arios and Serethid. In an earlier uh, video, I believe in the races video, I had discussed elements. And here we have sun and moon. And that are the two gods that are represented by those elements, Arios and Serethid, uh, respectively. Now imbued with knowledge eternal and wrapped in the pathways of fate and drunk from Valar's cauldron, Serethid gazed with endless curiosity on the roads of Cathos. These are the various paths of fate. It dreamed of one that would give knowledge and power a form. So here we begin seeing the, the dream of physical reality. On this road was Dranathus created. From it sprang the beginnings of all things physical, a mighty twisting path that contained all the secrets of Serethid and the dreams of the Tiasar. It burned bright, but this new physical creation was not yet tempered. It shattered into many bits, and from Dranathus's mouth was uttered the first true sounds, the sounds of creation in a physical form. There's some debate as to what exactly that sound was, but there's a footnote on the page that I'll read at the end of this uh, that kind of gives you a hint as to what it might be. Jernathus would speak no more, nor exist any more, however, for it had faded as quickly as it came, and in that moment the god knew of endings, that which is called conclusion, or that which we call death. Apaya mourned Jernathus's disappearance, this child of the gods, and touched the shattered remnants of its physical form, thus bringing balance to life and death. Valar dreamed of new forms, and from its hand it pulled twenty-six fingers. From them it fashioned a physical being that would oversee physical creation. Valar named it Benos, and with its hand it placed the first tool of physical creation, a metaphorical hammer. Benos gathered within it Arios's light of knowledge and Zerithid's wisdom of when to reveal it. It learned the ending of all things from death and secrets of making Rishthadil's dreams a physical reality. The children of the Tirsar gazed through timeless eyes upon Benos, and new dreams were dreamt that illuminated the pathways of the tapestry of fate. From these dreams was physical reality formed, and through the balance of Aparia was it balanced. Now life could exist, eternal, and thus Scythlia was created, the first true eternal physical being. Now that is, uh, that's that, but uh, first the footnote. Now the Smiths of Valar are one of the religious sects, uh, one of the many religious sects within Evendale. The Smiths of Valor uh, may sound to be like, uh, like blacksmiths or what have you, but they, um, they are the ones who have tasked themselves with uh, unraveling the secrets of creation. Um, some say that they should properly be called the Smiths of Benos, but maybe they know something that others don't. Uh, Benos is more the god of creation, destruction, and uh, preserver of knowledge within Evendale, while Valor is more about uh, causing change. In that sense, Benos is more an aspect of Valor. One of the things here that was teased, however, is the name. And so the footnote goes on. The Smiths of Valor believed Trinathus uttered the true name of that twisting, um, that twisting thing, which was described in the narrative, that twisting thing resembling a helix. In this case, they call it the Kaldrafa helix, um, but they keep the actual word of creation to themselves. 
So maybe they just have an awesome PR campaign and they, and they claim to have the word of creation, that which can undo and do all things. Who knows? In one of the campaigns within Evandale, however, it was featured. It was like a two or three year campaign amongst five different games, three of which eventually came together in, I believe, 2013, April 2013, in something um, uh, uh, called EvanCon. And we resolved all the various plots, and they all came together and rewrote history, which led to an event known as the Interregnum, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, this concludes the pre-physical world creation mythos, and what happens after that I uh, kind of went over in races, but the short version of it is that Scythlia had created the physical universe following the laws of physics that we understand in our real world. Uh, to, uh, however, with it also comes magic. And so with magic, which is created from the divine, um, uh, also stated in races, all arcane magic is actually divine in origin. Um, however, it, is, uh, it was tampered with at, at a particular point in history to create arcane magic. And thus you can do it, you can, well, essentially... Um, mortals created arcane magic from divine, and f therefore they don't need to worship uh, to gain it. They don't need to pray. Instead, they just do. They will upon it um, their own reality, and thus magic is then creates reality. Um, so who are the gods? What are they actually called? Well, the Tearsar, like I said before, are kind of like these proto-deities who uh, represent all a physical reality, excuse me, all a possibility, endless possibility, not only this physical reality, but many other kinds of realities. And hence the other planes of existence uh, can be explained by this as well. So it could be said that the realm of fire existed long before physical reality. That's up to you to decide if that's something you really want to get into if you want to use Evandale as your world setting. But there are other classes of gods. I mean, you have the Tearsar, which are uh, non-sentient and emotionless. And in the narrative, we've uh, it was described that Arios was furious, indicating that there's a sense of ideology there against which Sereth had uh, um, bucked. And um, so that kind of gives you an idea that, the, that these gods, as they progress more towards a physical reality or over the course of time, started gaining a little bit of sentience into their own. But when physical reality came about, that's when a new class of gods really came into being, Benos being the first of them, Sithlia, Sithlia being the a real true creator of physical reality. Benos was more the gateway from the Tearsar or the children of the Tearsar into physical reality, and Sithlia was actually the one that kind of pressed the button and kick-started the physical universe. These gods, uh, all of those that I am about to list and discuss uh, to some degree, uh, are known collectively as the Adrahar. And the Adrahar are um, strictly gods that mortals have categorized. And there's about 40 of them, and this includes Benos and Scythlia. Um, there are not many racial gods. Uh, the gods were all, I mean, they all kind of stemmed from various concepts or various facets of those gods which had existed before. And there's one thing that we have to remember. If, if that narrative confused you, it's, it's, it's supposed to be vague. It's really supposed to be up to your interpretation as to what exactly happened. But here's the general principle of it. You have a bubble, and within that bubble are infinite other bubbles. The, each of those bubbles represent one particular form of a uh, possibility of some kind. Um, I mean, really anything. It's, you, you think of it, and it's a bubble. So... The bubble then split, and uh, kind of like using cell division as, as an analogy, uh, the bubble split or cells split, in your choice, you use what analogy you want. Uh, and with that became a slightly more defined aspect of that which preexisted. And then that split, and then that split, and then that splits. And so from one bubble came many, and each of those became more and more refined. Some of the bubbles, however, started to collide with each other, and that's also the, uh, this narrative uh, discusses that to some degree. From other gods came others, and Aparia touched and introduced balance, and thus the bubble of Aparia was <laughs> touched upon another one, and some of that soapy goodness, I guess, mixed in, whatever. So, but the point here is, is that um, they all came from the TSR. So this very, uh, on uh, evandellrpg.com forward slash gods, uh, the very first of the gods that you see listed alphabetically is Alfmir, uh, which is also known as Iladir. 
in the elven uh, tongue, Ilidir means um, kind of like God of the Elves, Il, I-L, being, meaning elf or first people by their own language. Alfmir is the term that the, uh, is the name rather that humans, uh, in particular human scholars, have given the name of this. And Alf, A-L-F, being the name of Elf in one of the older human tongues. And that's why that's there. Uh, they are known. Alfmir is known as the father, mother of home, and the green one. Now, there's not too many gods of dwarves or halflings or orcs or this, that, or the other thing. Scythia kind of being the uh, the the goddess, being a physical deity, the way that she, well, I say she, but the way that it manifested itself uh, in her way um, was was to have, biologically speaking, a male and female within nature that when they come together, then of course they would be able to reproduce, but that is not the case in all creatures, some of which are asexual, some of which are all sexes. It's just, it's a big mishmash of whatever. You decide what exists in your world. It's all entirely possible under Scythia. But Alfmir's presence really does raise some questions. Why is that one listed and not the others? Well, there's a little bit of a history behind that, it's kind of being written now as to what exactly that is, but that's going to come out with a supplement which is really just just focuses on the elves, and then we will see how Illidir kind of fits into the mix and why Illidir is there. Um, some do say that Illidir was the very first iteration of Evan or Eving that was later killed, but I'll get into that in a little bit. We also have Arios, of course. Uh, some see Arios as a feminine figure, one that gives life, incredibly powerful, all powerful things in Evendale, according to mortal belief, for those who really want to define things by gender, t tend to see things, uh, the mass of creating, uh, the, uh, creating beings, uh, except for Benos, as feminine. Um, makes no, no wonder uh, women have this incredible ability to create new humans, so maybe that's where that came from. Um, did other mammal races think of that? Do, they, do the asexual races have uh, different uh, terms for these gods? Again, totally up to you to decide. Um, but these are the pronouns that are used by the scholars who wrote this. So history is written by those who write it, right? So this isn't the end-all, be-all. This is just a mere guideline of what most think. So Arios exists. Um, it's stylized by that of a sun. Uh, its domains are fire, law, protection, and sun, if you really want to get down into domain-based clerical magic. But even then, Arios, as a representative of fire, could also be used in elemental magic within Evendale and arcane. I mean, fireball could be said to be a, uh, a manifestation of Arios' own power through arcane magic. And again, I'll get into how the arcane came about in a second. You have Benos. Now, on the website, it also says slash Valor. Um, because from the mortal perspective, Valor is, cannot be possibly conceived and therefore is broken down into, excuse me, into a simpler term, Benos. Uh, that's why it's listed twice. But interestingly, the, the dwarves do call Benos Valor, and they refuse to call them anything but that. Uh, it's really only when talking to stupid humans do dwarves use the term Benos because humans cannot possibly conceive of Valor. Um, it's said that some of the more ancient books transcribed or the stone tablets uh, way back when, when the dwarves were first introduced to Evandale or first created in Evandale, um, that they had written the testimonies of Valor. And on there is Benos mentioned as being a separate uh, figure. Um, those in the Cortex Distinel in the city of Avar, this massive library called the Distinel, Supposedly, those tablets exist, or at least a fragment of them do. Um, there might be an entire adventure of dwarves uh, one day that goes out there and seeks that. Um, we, we'll see one day. Um, next is Chrysera. Now, Chrysera is considered an evil deity uh, born out of jealousy. The, this is about when I'm going to break off from listing all the gods and really talk about the concepts of good and evil, and law and chaos. Um, first off, it's really up to you in your, in your world to determine how this is actually manifested. Is good absolute good? Is evil absolute evil? In the Pathfinder role-playing game, uh, there's an alternative system where you can use numbers to represent these things and hence varying degrees. 
you can be good one, two, three, neutral four, five, six, and evil seven, eight, nine, or something like that. And so you can kind of be good, and you know, like right around the three mark, it'd be really, really good on one. Um, I tend to use that uh, use that system to give a little bit of leeway. But then again, I also run games where paladins, uh, there are different kinds of paladins, one for each of the alignments. Um, and really only when it comes down to religion uh, or spells that affect specific alignments, do we really talk about good or evil. Other than that, there's really even evil creatures believe that they are doing good by them or their people or what have you. It isn't really until you get into the outsiders, like demons and devils and other things like that, that are more the personifications of these philosophies, and therefore evil is evil. Evil is, you know, like like Jason Friday 13 type of evil. It's just out there to kill, to destroy, or what have you, whereas good, you know, it's, well, you define good. So Chrysera is considered the frozen queen or the deity of ice. Well, what does ice represent? Ice represents more of a stasis, a holding on, a, a, um, a, an inhibitance, inhibitance, is that a word? Sure, it is now. So uh, an inhibiting of action. A, um, and that's the one thing in like in the country of Nudvryu, which is the, the frozen Northlands uh, way out to the east, um, northeast. Uh, movement, a lack of movement means death. And so Chrysera is seen to be kind of like this frozen deity, one who can cause people to stop moving, stop generating body heat, etc. on a very basic level. Um, but also that icicles uh, in a very crude fashion can be used as a weapon, but more to the point that ice and everything about it, it's unpredictable. Unless it's incredibly thick, um, you don't really trust an icy lake, right? I mean, un until it's like really, really thick and then you go out there or you can ice skate too, whatever. Boy, I just totally aged myself and talked about like a childhood thing here. Moving on. So we have Damarcane, which is next, and this is considered deity of destruction. And actually, the the next several of them are uh, kind of the younger gods, and there's not a lot written uh, about them up on the website, but it is there nonetheless. Damarcane is the deity of destruction, uh, through glory, in this case, through war. Um, if you have a, uh, uh, like an overzealous general that's going through and creating uh, or commanding its troops to destroy everything in its path from the perspective of those that are, um, uh, that are undergoing, well, sorry, for those who, who's, who are on the recipient side of that war, they may see that this as part of Damar Cain's action, regardless of what the general and, and, and its army may be uh, doing it for, whatever. Uh, so in this case, the deity of destruction is kind of seen as one who is also selfish. Um, so if you like that kind of a thing and you want to use that kind of a deity, selfishness, destruction, that's it for you. Uh, Damarnos uh, is the deity of light. Now, this is interesting. How does that compare to Arios, who's the god of the sun? Well, light in this case is something that illuminates, but Arios is said in the narrative to have this brilliant uh, knowledge, This uh, and it kind of burns things with its knowledge. Truth hurts, right? Well, that's that's where Arios comes in. But uh, Damarnos is more about the light as it reaches plants. So that's why it's good, it's sun, and it's community. So Damarnos may be seen as an aspect of Arios, um, uh, but definitely it's like a farmer's god, if you will. Uh, then you have Dragaran. Now this is different. Again, just like Damarnos may be an aspect of Arios, uh, Dragaran may be an aspect of Valor. Whereas Benos is mentioned in the narrative, in the creation, in the official creation myth, as being the catalyst for change to lead to physical creation, and hence Sithlia, Dragaran is kind of what comes after that. But Dragaran is really the god of, uh, the, the true god of the anvil. Whereas Benos, having, uh, being depicted with a hammer, is all, this is also a weapon. Uh, in the event known as the Interregnum, it is said that it is Benos, that was instructed by Scythia to destroy all the cities. Um, I'll get into that, but Dragaran would not be the one who does that. And so if you were a blacksmith and you were starting out and you want to imbue your weapon with something, maybe you would offer a blessing of Dragaran. Uh, and this is also community. 
Uh, so it's really the dwarven god of community, but because they have such a creation or a, um, a crafter community, uh, crafter uh, civilization and culture, Dragarin makes perfect sense uh, for them. And also of earth. Well, dwarves and earth, that kind of goes hand in hand no matter where you go. Uh, next we have Dra- uh, uh, Dragana. Uh, this is a chaotic, neutral deity of storms, uh, water and weather and chaos um, that is what a storm is. I mean, even meteorologists today cannot, I mean, we can, our, our, the, the science of meteorology is actually rather fascinating. We would like to think that we can predict these things. And we have these 20 day forecasts. Of course, it's always subject to change because chaos, weather is chaos. And so, uh, Dragana is really that free for all, just that, woohoo, I'm going to rain over here and not rain over here. I'm going to cause a desert here and not and over here. Um, but even then, uh, Dragana has to adhere to uh, has to adhere to the rules of Scythia. If Scythia created mountains here, and there's constantly wind coming on over here, you may have a rain shadow over here creating a desert. Well, uh, Dragana doesn't like that kind of thing, and so it really can attempt anyway its clerics through the control of storms and weather magic. Uh, cause it to rain in a desert for a very long time. So those kinds of things which are not supposed to happen that kind of break the rules of a party or that of balance, uh, Dragana may be the one who, uh, who em- empowers that kind of magic. Then you have Edomar. Um, Edomar is one-fourth, if memory serves, of the, uh, uh, the quadrumbrant of gods who oversee knowledge. So you have Arios, which is a god that just has this burning knowledge. You will learn, and you're going to learn by trial by fire. Um, inqu- uh, inquisitors may enjoy an Arios aspect, whereas opposite that, you may have uh, Serifid, who believes that knowledge should be sought after, not just smacked in the face. If everyone has knowledge, no one can be in power. Serifid is a little bit about power through knowledge, and therefore those who want to gain it actually have to work for it. So when uh, in the creation myth, when Serdith had wrapped itself in the um, in the tapestry of fate, it, it in a way was kind of forming a protective shell around itself, and in between it and the tapestry, the truths are hidden, and so the followers of Serdith uh, would follow, um, uh, would be ones who go out there and really seek it. Serdith is a god of um, like adventurers. We'll get in a little bit more to Serdith later, but how does all this come into Edomar? Well, Edomar is lawful good. This is, um, uh, well, you interpret, it, you interpret it however you want, but a deity of universal and absolute truth and wisdom gained through experience. So while Arios will blast you in the face with truth and believes that everything should be uncovered, um, uh, and Serethid believes that knowledge should be hidden away from, from most people and only given to those who want to work for it, Edomar is that in-between. Edomar is the one that you would pray to as you attempt to gain the knowledge. You are on the path to gaining knowledge. Edomar is your god, um, and particularly through experience. So a first-level adventurer going out there can be said to walk the road of Edomar as it goes out there and tries to, uh, uh, tries to gain experience. Uh, alphabetically speaking, we now come into the Edai. Uh, the Edai are water gods, uh, or water deities, rather. Um, there are three of them. They are called the Three Sisters. They are said to, uh, to oversee... Uh, well, let's see here. Well, we have... It's, it's been a while since I wrote about these. So um, they oversee water, um, such as weather and travel, uh, travel on water. Uh, that one is represented by Igios. So they each do have their own, even though they are typically worshipped or uh, prayed to um, as a single unit called the Edai. Each of them do have their own uh, name, Igios. And then protection and community is uh, Ignaria. And then you have healing and liberation. That's an odd sort of one. And that one comes from Ignimir. Um, liberation is, uh, is interesting. Um, there is an analogy that uh, a priest of the Edai may use when it comes down to liberation, and it may be that uh, water should never be contained, and so when a dam breaks, that's liberation of the water um, through destruction. 
So it's uh, maybe liberation in, in, uh, in certain aspects can be seen as a euphemism for destruction and, and a return back to the natural. Um, it could also be seen as a liberation, as in a freeing from oppression or what have you. So again, interpret that however you wish. Uh, there's a nice little write-up in here about uh, the temples of the Edai, where you can typically find them. Typically, they're no, uh, they are natural, such as an eddy, which occurs here like in a pool of water, or in the oceans themselves, there is a legendary temple to one of them or to all three or what have you. Underwater domains, or excuse me, underwater adventures may come across massive temples that are constructed of natural wreaths uh, that are all consecrated to the Edai, or maybe the Edai are just those happenstance uh, small little puddles that you that you step in on a, on a nice sunny day after a rain. It's really up to you however you want to do, uh, to do it. And when it comes down to clerics, um, I, I firmly believe that as a role player, you should have the freedom to uh, discover what, what aspects of your god are, are really within the tenets of that god. Uh, such as Valor being about physical creation, or Benos about being destruction, uh, about protection of knowledge, and fire and smithing. I mean, it's it's to me, it's one of the joys of playing a cleric character is that you can explore these things. And in Pathfinder's optional system of variant channeling, now you can really explore those facets, which is why there are so many domains to some of these gods. Uh, domains, of course, being the Pathfinder term for those facets of that god that you can actually manifest as magic. Um, or tenants thereof. So uh, we continue on with uh, Fanaur, and Fanaur is a uh, said to be a younger god, a deity of personal honor, of glory, and law, and nobility. Being lawful neutral uh, is really where the law, uh, lawful neutral priests, uh, clerics, and uh, paladins uh, found that they get the most power from this god. Um, and this may have been as a, a some aspect of another deity because it's really, really particular. It re, it's a deity of personal honor. So is that uh, kind of like a Ronin type that they have their own honor? They don't follow the law of anyone else, and that's why it's lawful because they will never break it, kind of like what a cavalier will do with their own codes. Um, or is that a, a personal honor that is adopted from a larger uh, codex of honor, such as handed down by a clan or a tribe or a knight uh, or, um, uh, or a, a noble house or what have you. Again, really up to you. So the next two gods are, uh, have been featured heavily in, uh, in some of my own campaigns, and this is Fein and Fair. Now, you'll notice in the narrative, there's a mention of a god called Conclusion or Death. It's one of the few that has a normal name, a name that is just capitalized and all of a sudden, or a word that becomes, that becomes a proper noun. Um, there's a reason for that. There's actually a name for the god of death, but no one knows it because it, it existed for a very brief period of time. To reiterate a story which I talked about in the, uh, in the first uh, episode of this uh, Behind the Scenes series, about Evendell. I talked about how Scythlia was a god of, or is a deity of life. Um, when Scythlia created the, the physical universe, uh, Scythlia ended up creating only life, and death did not exist in this realm. Everything fed off of divine energy, and that is how things grew. Uh, cells simply came into existence as they divided. Well, they used the nutrients from divine energy to do that. They didn't really rely upon soil or stuff. So it's even possible during the epoch of creation or the age of creation um, that, uh, I mean, if you ever wanted to hold a campaign where you go back in time to explore that, maybe you will see grass that grows in the air. Who knows? It's, it's totally up to you. Nothing says that during the age of creation, reality was as we see it now. Um, but as a deity of life and death not yet existing, when she created Evan, she created an immortal being and imbued that creature, Avine, with all of her divine energy. And Avine then went out there as this consort of, uh, of Scythlia. And when Avine was killed, uh, they say by a, a Slindaril, um, the uh, death was invited into this realm. Now, death came and is, and is that same um, being that existed, that pre-existed Scythlia, that which is known as endings or conclusion. Uh, as a matter of fact, when, when we had uh, Mutfi Alarp, 
Um, we had a, a, a LARP that was based off of a, a small a, a country of this world, and within it there was a storyline of how the god of death had was there and was known as endings and conclusions. And if you happen to be a player uh, from the uh, from the LARP and you're watching this, you're now going to learn a little bit of the history behind that. When death came into this world, it was because a, a if you will, a rip was created um, as a gate between this world and the world of the gods, wherever that world is. And through that, endings had touched Avon. Um, and uh, death was there for a very short period of time uh, until Scythia arrived and said, what the hell just happened? Why is this creation of mine dead? And why are its innards all over the ground? And death was a little bit confused by this because it had never encountered anything akin to emotion before. Uh, let alone inquisitiveness, by something like a god, such as what Scythia is. And so Scythia said, I want your power here in my realm. This is my world. What, what are you doing? And Death just said, I don't know what to... And just broke apart. Um, people say that it broke into a brother and a sister, um, collect, known as uh, Fayer and Fayan, respectively. And Fayer ended up becoming a god of um, uh, natural death, of a mortal, a god of natural death. We'll leave it at that. If something falls on you or you die of disease or in your sleep or old age or what have you, that is said to be of uh, natural death. But if you die of murderous intent, someone murders you, uh, specifically a mortal, another mortal, uh, or yeah, another mortal, uh, then it is said to um, be a worshiping action of Fayan, the sister. This is not to make... Uh, I, I don't actually know why the writers, uh, that meaning the scholars within Evendale, would have said that Fayan is, uh, is feminine uh, as opposed to masculine. I don't think it really matters. The depiction has historically been throughout the 37 years, well, throughout the, I think they were created like 15, 20 years ago. Um, the depiction has always been this one as an innocent young girl. And that may have been because of other, uh, other other fantasy worlds that I had come across, and I was just influenced by it at the time. Um, but a absolutely, you can make Fayan whatever you want. But regardless, Fayan has as its symbol a, uh, a it's a single vertical line with two lines coming out uh, by by the top, kind of forming what we would consider a cross, and then underneath that a dot. Well, that dot's supposed to be a drip of blood off of a bloody dagger. And that's what that is. Whereas Fayer is this uh, god of natural death, like I said, of, of, of decay, but is also uh, took with it the aspect of the inevitable from this god known as endings and death. And so you have as, as Fayer's domains decay, inevitable, repose, and healing, because the Fayer, uh, Fayerites, don't believe in murder. Therefore, they do believe in the restoration of life back to its normal course of action, and that's why healing is a part of that. Um, if any of you are really into symbology, I can tell you that the every single symbol here of these gods uh, does have actually a meaning, and I'll let you in on a little secret. If you take a look at the, uh, the symbol of Fayer, it's a horizontal line and then has a, a larger line on, on the upper side, and then a larger line mirroring it on the lower side, and then a small dot, and then a small dot on either side of that line on, on the other side. The horizontal line in most of these symbols represents the physical world, and that there is something having to do with life or mortal life, and that's above the line, and then below the line is kind of like the other worlds, whether that be shadow worlds or the world of death or what have you. And so in this case, we can see that Fayer is balanced between the two um, and always keeps an eye on that. Uh, moving on, we have a very unused, well, I shouldn't say unused, but I don't, I don't use it all that much, but it's, de it's definitely there, is Hadravir, and Hadravir is the deity of dragons. Now, dragons in the world of Evendale... Um, Certainly the chromatic and the metallic dragons, as we understand them in the game books, uh, do exist. However, uh, the primordial dragons, this is really where Hadravir comes in. Uh, it's it's kind of said that Hadravir is an amalgamation of several names of some of the primordial dragons, uh, but the only name that we have currently in the lore is Alraxis. And Alraxis was there 
is one of the last of the primordial dragons that Siltia had used to assist in the creation of things. Um, as a matter of fact, it is the wrath of Alraxis that turned the lands of green, or the fields of green, known as Lirani, just to the east of Deloran, the land of the elves, into the current land known as Dra'anan, this barren land that had been burned to a crisp by the wrath of Alraxis for actions that uh, some of the elves had taken. Um, Hadrvir has been very passive, and so not a lot of not a lot of humanoid creatures really know a lot about Hadrvir, a deity of dragons. But supposedly Hadrvir had been created by Sethlia to oversee the operations, if you will, kind of like a, a foreman, if you will, uh, maybe a manager type of uh, of the primordial dragons. And so uh, Hadrvir does not have any domains listed here because characters typically will not derive any kind of power from Hadrivir if they worship because they're not dragons. Uh, if you want to have dragons in your campaign or dragon kin or something like that, and you believe that Hadrivir would have an influence over them, or rather that um, that they could derive power through prayer or worship of Hadrivir, let me know in the comments here, and I'll be more than happy to populate that and let you know uh, what was created. As a matter of fact, I'll work with you on that if you want to fit that in. And if it makes sense, let's make a part of the Evendell canon. Now we head into the Harpies of Discord. Oh boy. All right. So the Harpies of Discord are Medjus, Earthus, and Zelris. Anybody who's ever played in any of the games has heard of these things because I love using these. As a matter of fact, one of the first of the modern games that I had created was a one-shot campaign where we had about seven people come together, um, old friends, and they... Uh, we're portraying these characters over a mega event, like from a Friday through a Sunday, almost nonstop with it, but like only sleep here and there, but definitely more beer and wine than, than sleep. Um, and they ended up journeying through uh, through a section of Eastern Ivari into Dra Anan to discover some stuff there that was that they found was absolutely horrible. Uh, and one of the things that they discovered was a well. Well, it is said, there's a whole story of this uh, up on uh, EvendaleRPG.com. I'll see if I can find it somewhere. Yeah, Lore of Feyen and the End Times is the name of that story. Uh, and it really does discuss how the Harpies of Discord came about. Well, they are demigods or demi-deities. And as demi-deities, they are actual physical beings that PCs can encounter. Um, they are not to be trifled with. They might as well be like a Tarrasque. If you don't know what that is, it's it's a nigh unkillable uh, creature that you just never want to encounter. Um, the Harbors of Discord are akin to that. They are the children of, uh, of Feyen. Uh, they were created from mortals and thus roam the world as immortal mortals. Um, and they oversee plague and undeath, and that's where you get your undeath control from, from an actual being walking around controlling all of the undead Medris. Then you have the demodity of perverted truth and twisted lies or occult knowledge for one's own gain, or one's own selfish gain, and that's Earthus. And then you have Zelrus, the demodity of the mad moons. Uh, keep in mind, Evandel has two moons, um, and when... When one of them is, when they are both half uh, and they face away from each other, it is said to be uh, the time of Zelris, the time of the cracked moon. And that is when, um, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. It's when, they, when they're facing each other like this, when the two halves are facing each other. It's cracked, and that's the time of Zelris. And this is when chaos and madness and trickery comes about. Certain... Um, Certain countries, Mutvia being one of them, uh, I want to say Tumbria also has something akin to this. Um, Nudriu, I believe, does as well. And certain small portions of Ivari, way out to the west, they will have festivals. Uh, I wouldn't say that they are dedicated to Zelris, but it's akin to Twelfth Night, if, I'm, if my, my own real world history is not off. It's a time of, mischief, of mischievous, uh, mischievousness, akin to like Halloween, for example. Um, and so you may encounter lots of trickery where kings become peasants and peasants become kings and, uh, and all sorts of stuff. Well, that's really, really, really difficult to, uh, to rationalize if you are a really good PC or a good character. And the reason for that, I'll explain, but it all has to do with the physics of religion. In, in Evendale and how the gods are actually powered. 
They're powered, in short, by action. So I could pretty much leave it at that. But moving on, um, next to Chrysler, we have Hildert. And Hildert is really a god of uh, kind of a nudryu. It's a deity of winter. But also uh, Hildert, Hildert is the teacher of lessons through catastrophe. Um, when we talk about ice cracking and swallowing up entire communities, that's the actions of Hildert. But it is not meant to destroy in the sense of like a murder. It is meant to teach a lesson. In other words, don't build your home on thin ice. That simple. If you fall and you slip and you, and you break your butt on ice, that's probably the trickery of Hildert teaching you pay more attention, walk properly, walk on the balls of your feet. Um, and its uh, weapon is a spear. Uh, Hildir is also the a, a deity of community, and that kind of binds together that whole you know, all right, everyone, you know, let's let's remain a community and teach each other stuff, uh, teach each other lessons of how to persevere and survive in these uh, really harsh environments of the north. Um, we had discussed in the, uh, in the in the opening narrative Iparia, this god of balance. Well, somehow, some way, Iparia's touch comes through. And if you may remember, Eparia was the one who had touched the creature that would eventually be known as Benos, and Benos became uh, kind of like a blueprint of physical reality that Sophia then used to create physical reality. Um, Eparia does exist in this world, uh, and it's a deity of restoration of natural state, and hence balance is, uh, is where we get that. Uh, artifice healing and protection is typically how Eparia uh, manifests itself uh, in terms of divine magic. However, I will state that balance is absolutely a part of it, but the domain isn't here. And much like any of the other gods uh, listed up on EvendelRPG.com, feel free to add new domains uh, to this. Um, all right, and then you have Iveria. Now, there's a country known as Ivari. Its old name was Iveria, and there's a reason for that. Uh, it is said Scythlia had two daughters, one of which is known as Kyria, and the other one is known as Iviria. Um, Iviria is said to be the demi-deity of humans and of civilizations. Iviria is said to be the patron deity of Avar, but others say that the patron deity of Avar is Kyria. Well, one of the original names of, I believe, southern Iviria was Kyria. Um, so there's a little bit of story behind that, and it really has to do with the evolution of Evendell as I was creating it. And there was some mishmash of ideas in my head. What it really comes down to is both of them are the demigods of, or demi-deities of humans um, in particular, although um, Iviria is really said to be for humans, and Kyria is really meant for all communities, regardless of your actual species. Uh, Kittisil is an interesting one. Kittisil is considered a deity of midnight. Now, when we talk about midnight, what we're talking about is a transition from one day to another. And so uh, Kittisil is really a deity of protection, but it's in, in, in certain countries, and this kind of goes with all the other gods, in certain countries, Kirisil is worshipped a little bit differently. Uh, so when we talk about religion, why, you know, like what is the religion of Kirisil? Well, where are you? Well, I'm in Mutfia, okay? Are you in southern Mutfia or northern Mutfia? Okay, you're in northern Mutfia. All right, um, what is your caste? Because in Mutfia has several castes, the commoners, the nobles, and the, and the drosti. Uh, the itinerant people, which range anywhere from um, mercenaries to uh, to shamanistic uh, travelers, to fortune tellers, to uh, uh, clerics in their own right, um, they're all over the they're all over the map. And Kirisil in northern Mutfia is seen as the protector of the Drosti, those who must travel by night in order to get away from the wrath of the nobles. Whereas Lirtis, which we'll mention in a, in a little bit, is seen as a protector of nobles, and um, only in Mutfia. Uh, and the persecutor of those who defy noble, uh, noble rule. So Kirisil, while a chaotic neutral deity, does have aspects to it, like all the gods do, um, that would make it kind of not chaotic neutral, but instead more lawful. So are these gods really the law and the evil and the chaos and the good that I have listed up on the page? No, not really. They're, that's just how most of them are worshipped or seen. Um, so darkness, knowledge, and magic is are the domains of Kirisil in this particular form. 
Uh, Kyria exists as a demi-deity communal spirit. I had already talked about that along with Iviria. Um, and here you see community, healing, protection, and, and repose. So Kyria is more the, uh, the deity of the hearth, if you will, and of community, regardless of the species, like I said. Then you have Lyrtis, which is uh, the truth, the trial, the mortal law. Um, this is the deity of law, justice, and truth. Now, okay, we're not talking about objective truth. Lyrtis, while lawful good, does not necessarily mean objective. Um, this is the deity of law, the child of mortal law. This is the one, the, the deity that can be seen as the one who is called upon to enforce rule, um, as opposed to natural law, which is rather objective. It's not subjective at all. It's Natural law is just that mudslide will wipe away your village. Well, that, that's, <laughs> that's law. That's just how that works. Um, but Lyrtis can be seen as selfish. Um, and the notion of a, uh, uh, a goody two-shoes paladin following Lyrtis, you might, there might be some debate there. So whether that paladin is actually good. Uh, the paladin may fully believe that they are 100% good, but I kind of started this off by saying that good and evil law and chaos are kind of like, you know, they're, they're areas of gray here. Um, and certainly a paladin of Lyrtis may be one of the most selfish people out there carrying forth their... Uh, their lords, uh, their lords' laws. Um, so, or they're, they're, you know, it's so it's really up to you as to how you want that. But if you like the concept of like the vengeful knight, who is out out uh, who is out there to capture uh, and um, uh, bring to justice anyone who would dare defy their noble uh, queen or what have you, Lyrtis would be the god that uh, uh, that that is. We move to Lyrter. Uh, Lyrtis is the god of natural law. Well, we were just talking about that, and this is kind of opposite. Uh, excuse me, this is kind of opposite uh, Lyrtis. And if you take a look at the symbols, you'll notice that they're actually kind of opposite. You have these um, uh, these arcs uh, of lines that go this way with uh, Lyrter, but uh, with uh, Lyrtis, you have them going this way. And so there's some opposites there, and that that is done on purpose. But you'll notice that their alignments are not opposite: lawful good and lawful neutral. Uh, Lyrtur's got a natural law, balance and, and justice and law, strength and protection. This is more the objective uh, one. If I had to give you the quick story, Lyrtus would have been touched by Aparia and said, hey, balance now. And then Lyrtur would have been created and go, oh, oh, right, okay, yeah, justice, actual universal justice. Um, you've been going around and you've been killing a lot of people, time for you to be killed. That's that kind of justice. But we're talking murder, not just, you know, I need to go around and kill things to eat. That's different. Um, that's more Nordaga, but which we now move on to. Nordaga, oh boy, Nordaga uh, first appeared sometime around 1991 on the character sheet, 1991 or 1992, as it appeared on a character sheet of my friend Jeff Davis. Uh, he had created a character by the name of uh, Dimitri. Uh, he was a Mutvian, uh, and he roamed the lands of Mutvia, and he worshipped a god by the name of Nordaga. And back then, I think Nordaga was more the, and actually still is, uh, kind of now that I think about it, that 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 god of the wilds, that deity of the wilds, always seen these days by outsiders as a feminine presence, this wrathful figure. Whereas Mutvians just see Nordaga as Nordaga, uh, a completely neutral uh, deity that lives within the land and in the country of Mutvia where the dirt is thick and uh, rusty brown uh, with the uh, rendered fat of all those who have died and rusty brown because of the blood and it's greasy, it's nasty. Uh, they say that is where, that is how Nordaga reaches up and touches everything and from that the plants grow wild and wicked and really gives a flavor to the lands of Mutvia. Um, and there's a whole thing in here uh, about Mutvia and the destructive and life-giving forces of nature can be said to be embodied in Nordaga, the wild witch of Mutvia. To some, she represents the land itself, uh, although outside the country, Nordaga goes largely unrecognized. Um, in certain other lore, the Nordaga is seen as the sister of Scythia. Now, if you remember in the story of Scythia, when death appeared and then split into Fain and Fair. Scythia was banished, actually, from ever stepping foot in her own world because Scythia is a deity of life, and this is a world in which death now exists, and you can't have that. So Scythia got ejected, if you will, or uh, sequestered to, uh, 
to the to a particular island which she had created as her home called the Isle of Evan by others who, who make maps. Um, I don't know if Sithlia actually calls the island that. I don't think she does. Nope. No, she doesn't actually. There's. I just remembered something about that. And that's a neat little secret. What does Sithlia call the Isle of Evan? little secret for you. So maybe uh, that'll come out in a supplement or something. Um, but when Sethlia, when Sethlia left this world and retreated or was, was exiled to the Isle of Evan, uh, what was left behind to really oversee that which she had created? And that would, that would be an aspect of Sethlia known as Nordaga. That's how some scholars would say it. Others would say that Nordaga is a land embodied, um, is the bloodthirsty god of sacrifice to whom you must have sacrifices. Certainly, they believe this in Mutvia. Otherwise, the uh, the bounty of the harvest will not be well. It would not. It will be thin that year. Uh, this was really practiced in the LARP when, in January, uh, in a January event, they sacrificed uh, things to Nordaga. They held a whole ritual that went on all throughout the night. It was awesome. And then, like eight months later, the bounty from their fields, uh, the farmers in the game suddenly had lots of stuff. That's because Nordaga's touch had been used uh, way back in January and uh, evoked the, um, we're talking like time on a geological scale. So eight months in a LARP is actually rather long, uh, but real reality, that, that beast, such a beast would have probably lasted for like the next 20 years. But nonetheless, there, that is Nordaga. Then you have Nikella. Uh, Nikella is the deity of the tear folk, and I have as a parenthetical halflings. When the Tear Folk were created, the Tear Folk, just as a reminder, um, if you haven't watched the races one, the races video, um, the Tear Folk were kind of the first halflings, or at least they like to think so. They remain um, itinerant pretty much in the deserts and the, uh, um, the deserts and the savannas of the east, uh, particularly the northern deserts of uh, Melech and the southern uh, steppes and what have you, southern Kultrek. Uh, they worship Nikella, who is lawful good, hands down, a, a pleasant, uh, you will find some of the friendliest clerics uh, worshiping Nikella, and almost every single one of them are uh, tear folk. Um, and that does not actually speak of the attitude of the tear folk. They tend to be honorary SOBs. They, they don't really want to deal with anyone else, but they're master traders. They're fantastic. Um, and they're hardy little things. Uh, I can't even say little. They're average size, like three foot five or so, and like up to four feet, uh, like the height of dwarves. Um, then we come down to Anamar. Now, Anamar was not created by me, but it was actually created by a, a friend of mine, uh, Howie. Uh, Howie ran a, an Evandale campaign. It was the first one I had ever been in that I didn't run and was set in the world of Evandale. So this was a great honor of mine to be a, uh, to be a part of that game. And I remember the conversation that we had, which was, he was like, hey, Steve, do you mind if I run a, a game in your world? I was like, uh, no, you know, <laughs> so why? Uh, you can only do it under one condition. And he thought it was, well, don't change anything or this, that, or the other thing. I was like, no, I, I have to be a player. And so my character uh, went through a series of adventures where this mortal, uh, where this mortal had become a god uh, by the name of Anamar and became a demi-deity of undoing, of destruction and fire and loss was how I later defined it. And so I brought Anamar into the canon because someone else had, had, had created this. So if you have ideas about the world of Evendale and there's stuff in there, creations that you want to incorporate into your own version of the setting, let me know if it's a really good idea and it makes sense as far as the canon goes. Let's make a part of the canon. That's what this is all about. Um, along with uh, Aparia from pre-Sithlia days, we have Rishladel, the deity of dreams. And this is seen, Rishladel is seen as the first of the non Tirsar Tessarian gods. Um, and along with uh, Rishladel, who's still seen in a kind of, I think it's Hermes. Isn't Hermes the messenger of the gods uh, in that, in that uh, mythology? Um, uh, Rishladel is the same thing, a, a, a conveyor of messages from the Tirsar. Uh, along with the other pre Scythian deities, we have Serethid, this deity of shadows, occult knowledge, and hidden treasures. Um, Serethid is uh, seen as a blindfolded man with a lantern, if you want to go into symbology on that, um, while Rishadel's symbol is the half moon, representing half in darkness and half in light. Um, there is a story behind the half moon as representing the, the, uh, the deity of dreams, 
Um, maybe we'll get to that uh, sometime in the future. Then, of course, you have Sithli, who is uh, considered true neutral, the elemental deity, uh, owing to uh, her use of the elements to create elementals and from them to create the fae, from them to create the elves, and from them to create the various different kinds of elves and also the dwarves, which no dwarf will ever admit that they were that he had come from the elves in Evendel. Uh, there's a little bit in here that talks about the erstwhile deity of the material plane. Sithlia was of the Tearsar, uh, and from her sprang physical reality. Uh, with the application of the world rewriting calterific helix, which marked the beginning of the interregnum, this is a, uh, this is a whole other story. Sithlia was recast as a deity of earth spirits, including the fey and the elementals. It is said that druids whether admitting it or not, derive their power from the, uh, from the elemental deity. So while Sithli had created all a physical existence, and druids have the ability to affect primarily nature, it is said that certain arts druids in certain areas of Evendale can actually affect all of physical reality, not just uh, nature is what we typically see them as. Uh, moving on, we have Talavir, who's the deity of the under-earth and nature corrupted. And here again, we see the horizontal line as the symbol, and this time two dots above and below. Uh, this is a little bit different than uh, than Fayer. It's actually a perversion of Fayer's own symbol. Um, and uh, we see here a deity that oversees the land of the dead. Now, you may remember um, that uh, one of the Harpies of Discord is actually a deity of the undead. Well, the beings that reside in the Underearth uh, would fall under the auspices of that harpy of discord. But the actual land called the under earth is actually overseen by someone else. And that is known as Talavir. Talavir's entire purpose is to make fun of Scythia. It's the exact opposite uh, with the exception of the alignment. This one is incredibly selfish while Scythia is, well, Scythia is selfish, but in a neutral kind of way. Uh, whereas Talavir is chaotic evil, and it's just no ifs, ands, or buts. This being was born to be that way, and Talavir's own creation, and that again, much like all of these things, uh, have to be covered in a uh, uh, in a separate uh, video. Uh, we move to Tarismer, who's the deity of trade. Um, this is uh, those who wander the roads may worship uh, Tarismer and look for luck uh, as they as they trade, and also a little bit of profit. Uh, Tadusmar is said to have another aspect, which is known as the Urchin. We'll get into that in a second. But moving on, we have Thela. This is the first of the deities that really addresses mortal emotions. Um, and it apparently there's enough mortal emotion that talks about vengeful love and the insanity that can come from love, which is uh, like, you know, the, the, the completely selfish stuff. Um, it's fire, it's unbridled, it can destroy, it is insanity, it is love, madness, murder, protection, and the vengeance inquisition. So Thela is, um, there are actual inquisitors of Thela. Uh, they will go out there and persecute you because you did wrong by your, uh, by your, uh, your significant other or something along those lines, and they are considered chaotic neutral. They just go upon whims. And so really, Thela can be seen as a deity of whims. Then you have Tirla. Oh boy, I can't even tell you how many stories were based on this in my own uh, in my own games. So uh, again, talking about Mudfield Arp, talking about the Inquis um, the uh, the Interregnum and other stuff uh, that I had run. Tirla was a big, big, big player. This is a lawful evil deity of nightmares. This is the one when Richladel made its presence in, uh, within the physical realms. Uh, Tirla, owing to uh, the need of balance in the world due to Aparia, appeared. And so here you have dreams, well, here you have nightmares. It's like that kind of a thing. Tirla uh, is probably one of the trickiest ones out there and will use anything to, uh, to get its way. Um, Tirla is also one of the only evil deities that has a worldwide following known as the Creed of Star. And while it's not always known as the Creative Star, it does exist everywhere. And it's horrible. There are inquisitors of this that, uh, that are actually rather good at, at trying to convince you to follow Tirla. And they sell their faith on the premise of um, only cowards uh, fold when you are experiencing fear. And instead, Tirla is a god uh, or a deity of courage and overcoming one's fear and becoming fearless. 
Um, sounds like a pretty powerful, uh, um, like uh, inspirational talk. Um, but the reality is, is that they just want more followers following Tierlin spreading nightmare and, and fear. Um, and so if you ever have a, uh, if you're ever looking for that horrible, horrible cult, that's the one, the creative star. There are others in Evandale. My God, there's all of them. There's all sorts of cults within Evandale. And in future videos, we will get into those cults as we start talking about uh, more governments and stuff. The, net, the video after this is going to be the various countries, and then we'll start dialing down into the various aspects of those countries. Uh, and then that will be cults. Unos uh, stands alongside Thela as a deity of love, in this case of romantic love. Um, Unos is seen, uh, its symbol is uh, akin to that of a dancer. Um, and one who gets wrapped up in that whole notion of romantic love uh, in Norwegian, you may call it or that for love, that, um, that uh, the, in the state of infatuation before that genuine love uh, takes over. Uh, certainly, Unos also covers lust and is chaotic good because it's good in, in intent, but chaotic in that you're still going to be driven everywhere to do anything. Um, I had mentioned uh, prior, uh, along with that Tatasmer, that an aspect of it kind of came out, known as the Urchin. This is the hidden master. Um, if uh, Tatasmer and Zerithet had a baby, it would be the Urchin. Um, this is a coin that is pierced by a dagger. Um, pardon me. This is the, uh, the deity of rogues, if you will. And uh, the Urchin, all of its temples are like thieves' guilds. Uh, they all kind of worship the Urchin, or at least a facet of the Urchin. And uh, of the facets of the Urchin in, in, uh, in, in gaming parlance, we call it domains, there's exploration. So the urchin uh, it could be seen as delvers, uh, as adventurers uh, who uh, go out there and search for mysteries in, in Serethid's fold. Um, there is thievery. So there's your, um, th there are your rogues right there. Knight, your skulking, stealthy ones. And then there is trickery. So also illusionists um, will follow the urchin, uh, particularly hedge mages uh, who may use illusions to uh, put up shows and what have you. And um, that's... Uh, well, they may also worship them. There's a little bit of a story there. Uh, it's the only Tisserin deity to not have a proper name. Um, kind of untrue, considering that there's death, endings, and conclusion, which is that whole uh, deity there. But there is actually a name for that one. The urchin really is just the urchin. Um, and the last two, there's Vasha. Uh, Vasha is the mistress of the mind, the grip, the ring. It is the deity of inspiration and lyric poetry. This one was brought about... Um, Vasha has a very special place in my heart uh, for reasons which I'm not going to go into publicly, but I could tell you that Vasha was absolutely a, a pleasure to create because I felt it in that moment. Um, and that's why a deity of inspiration and lyrical poetry was created because it actually was a mistress that was controlling my mind. And a mistress in, this, in the figurative sense, this, um, uh, this concept of I am on such an inspirational path right now uh, and that's why I called it the grip. You no, know, it grabs you. If you are an artist, this is Vasha. Uh, this is your art. This is your your deity. Um, if anyone here is a creator, and or, or whether you are a writer, a sculptor, uh, uh, a, a painter, what have you, um, anything that you do, if you understand what I mean by I get into the zone and time and the world disappears, that is the grip of Vasha. Uh, and then last we ha we, lastly, we have Yasara, which is the deity of manipulation, um, and in particular of magic. Uh, if anyone has ever used magic to gain their own uh, hold on things, it could be said that that's the actions of Yasara. Okay, so that is the, that's all the mortal deities or those, uh, those deities that the mortals know. So what exactly is the physics of religion? Well, the short version is pretty much what I said before. It's action. You don't need to worship a deity in the, in the active sense. You don't need to sacrifice many times. I mean, some deities will. Some deities demand that. Um, but the, uh, the action of, of just conducting a particular action that happens to fall into it, like murder. There's lots of murder all over. I mean, if you've ever played Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder, you murdered things. Um, fighters are particularly good at it. Assassins just happen to be the ones that really specialize in it. Um, and they can be said to worship uh, Feyen through their actions. And so that is, that's a, 
how, you know, from the point of view of an orc or a kobold, who's the evil one? You know, here's the orcs are just trying to have their community of war and 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 stuff, and uh, here comes a human paladin, and all of a sudden they get they die, uh, the orc dies, and while the other orcs may go, they're fan, and you know, it's <laughs> so that's what I mean. Good and evil. You kind of have to uh, if if you're going to go by my philosophies, then allow for gray areas in your game. It allows for so much more interest. If you really do like those hard lines of good and evil and law and chaos, um, you may find these gods a little bit easier to deal with. They are, I, I mapped it out, they're kind of balanced in terms of the number that are, that, are, that are lawful good and those that are chaotic evil, those that are lawful evil and those that are chaotic good, and then all the neutrals. Um, they're kind of balanced in terms of numbers. I think there's like seven per or something like that, or, or four per or whatever. Um, but either way, so it is the actions that fuel the deities. Um, furthermore, worship of the deities kind of follow real-world polytheism in that very rarely did you dedicate yourself to one god. So a cleric of, uh, of these games, while they can only worship one god for game mechanics purposes, it is said that many people throughout the world would worship many gods depending upon the, the, the need for it. So if you were looking for fertility of the land, maybe you would, uh, uh, maybe you would conduct a, uh, a ritual of sacrifice to, let's say, Nordaga, who controls the, uh, uh, the fields, or maybe uh, that to the, uh, to the deity of the hearth. Uh, if you're looking for a uh, luck in the home or safety in the home or what have you. So um, that could be one person may worship many different gods, but in that sense, more, more like pay homage to, uh, to gods, depending upon the purpose. So feel free to use that if you want. Um, also on the page, uh, there is something that uh, is for holy times and days. This is more of a house rule that I'm beginning to introduce in my own games. I, I kind of like it. Whereas clerics, um, you know, for all these years, I really thought that a cleric had to sleep for eight hours and then get their spells uh, like one hour prayer after. Uh, just like wizards? No, no, no. I, 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 I've been entirely wrong this entire time, and it was pointed out to me by one of my players, Wraith, that no, clerics don't need to do that. Clerics can decide on a time of day, and that's when they get their spells after one hour of study or, or prayer or whatever. Um, and so, or, or maybe they don't even need that. So I created this house rule called Holy Times and Days. And because Evandale does have its own calendar, and it does have its own lunar cycle, and it does have high, uh, high feasts and festivals and, uh, and everything else, um, in this, uh, in this, I hope to write it up a little bit more. There's holy times. These holy times are the times of the day that clerics will typically get all the spells back. In this case, like with Nordaga druids. So, um, it's at noon or, or at midnight, this deity would get, you know, they the clerics of these deities would get, it, or maybe at sunrise and sunset, or maybe when there are, um, uh, when the cock first crows in the morning, that's when it happens because that's a messenger of that particular god. Uh, or maybe when the tide comes in in the morning and the first time you smell that seaweed, that's when you get your spells. So if you are playing a cleric in the world of Evendale, feel free to work with your GM or DM and discuss with them when that time of day is and how it really ties into your deity. You should make it personal. Absolutely, it should be personal. Um... And, and that's that. And then there are holy days. Well, much the same way that there are, are like high holy days, there are also unholy days for deities. And this is really if your GM or DM wants to take advantage of that, just like they would with holy times, um, the God's page will be filled with this kind of information. And what a holy day is, the concept behind it is, is that typically clerics can only get their powers once a day. Well, during a holy day, they can get it a, a more times, maybe two, three, or four times during that span of time in which this natural phenomena occurs, whatever the natural phenomena is for that deity. So when you're talking about, let's say, when the two moons of, uh, of Evendell, the, this particular planet of, the, of this uh, fantasy setting, excuse me, um, when they both become full, maybe that's when the uh, uh, one of the of Zel I believe it's Zelris. Oh God, I'm I'm getting tired. <laughs> I've been writing like all day. Yeah, Zelris, uh, the Mad Moons. Maybe that's when the uh, or the Cracked Moons when they're both half and facing each other. Maybe that's the high, the holy day 
of, uh, of Zelris, and that's when the clerics of Zelris really get empowered. But when they're facing the opposite direction, which is more the symbol of Nordaga, maybe that's when they don't get their powers uh, every day. Maybe they get it once every two or three days. So there has to be a balance there if you want to use that, uh, that kind of system. Anyway, that's, uh, that's pretty much it when it comes down to the religion of Evendale. There are many other things out there. Uh, so now I'm going to turn to... Um, I'm going to turn to the Q&A uh, that I see here. I see a lot of you joined this time around. Thank you so much. I'm so I'm so happy that you guys are here. So we have here people who are, uh, let's see here. Yeah, Jay Sully. So you mentioned the old masters. Absolutely. Yeah, the TSR, man. Uh, you have Lou. Uh, you mentioned Kathos. And Jaffe, if you guys followed the YouTube series, Jaffe is a character played by uh, Luis Martinez, a uh, great player. Uh, absolutely an honor to, uh, uh, to be his GM. Uh, Jaffe has much respect for the God of Fates. Yeah, I could see that. I could totally see that. Uh, Dana, uh, we went on a cruise for your honeymoon. Congratulations again. Hey, you got married. Uh, and tonight we were going to catch up on the two episodes we missed. Well, I, I hope you do. I really hope you like it. Uh, Dana said, this is way better. Okay, <laughs> lives are so fun. I don't know what you're... Oh, damn, I should have been paying attention to this at the time that you guys were posting it. Uh, let's see. And I hope that you guys enjoy them. Dana oh, okay, that's Lou talking to Dana. I'll move on now. Uh, Lou, we have loved everything so far. I'm excited. Uh, Jaffe, by the way, is a wonderful tune. Thoroughly entertaining. Okay, cool. Bubbles of potential. Yes, Dana, that's exactly what the tears are. are. Bubbles of potential. Um, I should... So now my, my marketing brain, what little of a marketing brain I have, uh, just kind of said, yes, I'm going to have Evandale bubble bath salts. I, I don't know where the hell I'm going with that. Damn, I'm tired. Uh, moving on. So we have here uh, Jessica. As a, yeah, absolutely. Jess, as above, so below. Uh, that's So many of the deities have that kind of a balance to them. So I, you know, I haven't even checked. I'm kind of curious. If a deity has neutral, do they all have a horizontal line? No, they don't. They all typically have a line somewhere, whether it's vertical or horizontal, representing something. And it's the gods that aren't neutral uh, tend to have something that is not. You know, I'm going to have to go back through my own symbology and see if that's a pattern that kind of crept up in my subconscious as I created that. Um, let's see. As about so below. Oh, pick me, Steve. Uh, Dana, I don't know what you're referring to because I was an idiot. wasn't looking at the comments as I was talking. Ah, I'm so sorry. What just happened here? Did my stream just end? Something went wrong. Please check my stream's connection. Uh, okay, I'm back. Woo! I don't know if you guys uh, lost contact or what have you. Um, but the Tarask is seen as a uh, as this agent of deity in the land of Drakamor. That is where the Tarask is. It was formerly called, uh, during the early years of its creation, like sometime in the 80s, it was formerly called the land of giants. Because when you're an early teen, this is, you know, land of giants, land of dragons, land of... Faye. Um, and the Tarask was, when I found that in whatever book that was first in, I think that was a Monster Manual or, or Fiend Folio or one of those, um, the Tarask was first mentioned. I was like, oh, oh, this is, oh, this is awesome. And immediately created like a level 40 something in like the first edition of D&D &D to, to go out there and go slay it because that's what you do. Um, nonetheless, yeah, when you absolutely need to have a TPK. Um, let's see, you were just talking about spellcasters and their needs. Okay, cool. And needy, needy casters. So the summary of all of this, and if you guys have more, please go ahead and uh, type it out. I'll be more than happy to address it right now. Um, let's see. Oh, we just had, uh, why no symbol for Kyria? So that's it. You know, that's an awesome question. So David, what ended up happening there was I recently underwent a revision of the world map and, uh, to update the, the country names. Uh, for example, a G no, Korfa had become Evendir for a period of time, and Ajil and Korfa ended up getting switched. They're both peninsular countries. And I went back to the original map, the, the, the actual hand-drawn one. It was like taped together hex paper, eight, eight and a half by 11s. Um, and I, when I took a look at that, I noticed that there were lots of like little cities and town names all over the place. And one of them was Kyria. And I remembered the creation story of Kyria from something like, you know, 25 years ago or 30 years ago, whatever it was. And I was like, I have to put Kyria in there. Well, I ended up uh, running a game at a game store, and I'm going to give them a free plug right now. Guys, I'm going to tell you, if you happen to be in the tri-state area and you are anywhere near, I, I want to say Franklin Lakes, go out to Marco Rama. 
Markarama is absolutely fantastic. I played games there. The the community within is great. The owners are absolutely fantastic. Highly, highly, highly recommend. They have a, like a wall of miniatures, which is beyond anything else I've ever seen. And my main reason for shopping there. Well, I was holding a game at this store, and one of the players had created a character that was really community centric. And so I was like, oh, wait, I don't I have a day a, like a god for that? And it, it was Kyria, but I didn't do anything with it. Uh, I didn't list it on the on the ranks of the gods. So I I quickly went up on my iPad, which I brought with me to the store, and I was like, hold on for a second. Tick, 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 and updated it. And sure enough, Kyria was now added to the list, but I didn't have a symbol drawn for it yet. So that's why there's no symbol for that. Um, so... Anyway, if you guys have any other uh, Q and A or or something like that, please go ahead and uh, type it out. I'll be more than happy to answer this. Uh, one thing to keep in mind: if you really want to remain uh, focused on the real power behind Evendale, it is once again that arcane magic comes from divine. But wizards don't need to be religious; they can be completely a religious uh, and still be able to cast spells. And again, that was because Avon's death occurred from a mortal. In this case, a slin, which I created a coarse blade. That is what their name means. The slindaril means the, well, the slindar in the old elven tongue means the carrier of the coarse blade. And that coarse blade was the thing that killed Avin, spilled all of his blood all over the land, and supposedly the actual location of Avin's death is in northern Mutvia, and it's because his blood soaked into the land that Mutvia soil still to this day is that greasy, nasty that it is. Uh, it just smells like permanent death in Mutvia. Its residents are very accustomed to nighttime. You close your shutters because the undead come marching through. Well, it's that same blood that had all of that divine power in it, but now it had been tampered, uh, tampered with or rather tainted by murder um, and mortal creation. No mortal had, prior to that point had ever created anything. So that blade, no tools, nothing. They lived in caves and stuff. They didn't, you know, they didn't even have rakes. Well, it was a, that coarse blade, according to, the, uh, according to the myth, that was the very first weapon, and thus mortals had become gods unto themselves. So when they killed the demigod, uh, Avine, and they spilled divine blood into the land, they actually turned it into arcane blood, and it corrupted so many. And it was the death, it was the uh, the death of Avine that then created um, the the next age, the second age, which is marked by the creation of humans by Scythia, and uh, the time when arcane magic came to be. Arcane magic ended up corrupting so many that it was such a it was like it just went everywhere. Um, and that corruption created the Atalti, which in the second age, known as Chaos and God Kings, the Atalti were mortals that uh, were perverted so much that they actually became like God Kings themselves. Uh, fortunately, the second age did come to an end, but if you want to run a sword and sandal game, uh, that's more along the flavor of Conan, um, while... Inf well, I can't say influence, but uh, while the Atalti would be like the, uh, in, at least in terms of appearance, something like Melnobonian in nature, uh, like an Elric type of thing, then Chaos and God Kings, the Second Age of Evendale, uh, would be where you would want to go. Um, the Third Age is really when you start seeing the old school adventures. Um, like keep on the borderlands and that kind of stuff, bugbears and unicorns and pegasus were running around all over the place. And that's really the time of mythologies and the time of heroes. And that's really you start getting into your underground uh, dungeon dwellers and stuff like that. When, uh, as the, as the setting began to mature and I began to mature and I saw my, uh, the outlook on gaming a little bit differently enter into the fourth age, which is, um, uh, a little bit lower fantasy, you know, a lot of magic was now used, and now we have lower fantasy. The gods start taking on more the eldritch gods of old, you know, and then you have these old, now you can go into the forest and into the jungles or into ancient mountains, and there you will find the old temples and ruins of former uh, civilizations from all of those other ages from, uh, uh, from there. 
and then we have the interregnum. Now, I had promised I was going to talk about this. I realize I'm now running over. Wow, it's like an hour and 24. Hold on for a second. So the interregnum occurred due to player action in one of the games, and I loved the I loved what they had done. They had grabbed or found in each of their individual campaigns pieces of the Caldrafa helix. Now, in the introductory narrative, like an hour ago, hour and 24 ago, I had mentioned that a creature by the name of Dranathes had come into being, and then just as quickly as it came out, it blinked away and disappeared. And it left behind the physical blueprint of physical reality. And But that shattered the moment that Scythia was created, which was kind of like physical reality version 2.0. And those two physical realities collided. The culture for Helix, this massive, in my mind, it was like this twisting path of destiny and, and what have it, and whatever, ended up forming something akin to a DNA strand, hence Helix. Where the term culture for comes from, mm, there's a whole story behind that. But either way, um, the uh, when the Helix, uh, one party found a, a small portion of the Helix and each of these stones have their own myths and legends. And some of those myths and legends, I believe, are up there on the site. Um, we have here Atlas Lore. Yeah, Lore, the Couch of Helix. Ah, here we go. So I did I did pop this up here. Uh, so this is the noted scribe Aristos Ri Colstir the, from the Epic of Creation uh, 2, which would be the Second Age. Uh, made mention of objects from the Epic of Creation or the Age of Creation, which is the First Age, that uh, was the precursor to the material plane, the physical objects that contain a form of pure elemental essence. Now, keep in mind, elements here are, are things of extreme power. Uh, it was said that these objects evolved in their, into their current state on their own before the necessary elements gathered to create what is now the material, uh, the material place. I think I meant material plane. Like water on curved piece of oiled parchment, the Caldera elements would soon be drawn to the worlds created. As Avondale was declared home to its creator, the elements would also make this their home. When placed end to end, there form a single spiraling tower in and through which all communication with the elder gods is possible. This is their gateway to the realm of Scythlia. This is the first hint, and I think it's the only hint of how you can actually get onto the Isle of Avon. You need to do something with the Couch of Helix. Um, let me see here. Uh, though it is their power, though uh, it is also their power that may be used in their name, nine of the Caltrofer elements were known to exist during the founding of Prundem by the Miradil. Now, there is a, a city by the name of Pundesh, which is the capital of Tala, the southernmost uh, nation. Um, maybe Prundem was the original name of it. I can tell you historically it was. So, and it was founded by the Miradil. This is the first time it's ever mentioned um, that, uh, that the Miradil actually created a city. I didn't realize that. Those are the desert elves, by the way, in case you don't know that. During the Prunesh Wars, three of the elements, the, uh, the Dranal Bath, the Orstelne and the Stradelba were used to annihilate 45,000 humanoids who assaulted the city by binding them to the area. Dranalabath control. Uh, turning the land to boiling blood. Orstelne, the transmutation stone. And finally, removing the bond between life and body. Stradelba, the scythe. Uh, each element may be used independently, as was reported by the Emperor Gal of Talis wherein a servant's body was changed in frame or form to create a gorajish, a ceremonial vase for his new bride. Like liquid, he flowed to become a gift, end quote. So you're talking about the ability to turn a physical being into a physical object that still can hear and see everything and thus will drive you mad. Compared to the annals of the Grandastium, which states, quote, sevenfold did Alan flow into new form, each in accordance with the Waritz words as held aloft the gem and commanded him as thus, end quote. Warit may refer to the Warit of Talis, who was said to gift the emperor with the Horadalvro, uh, which is the change of state stone. 
Needless to say, the legends of the Couch of our Helix are rather detailed and extensive. Uh, they are all over the place. Um, there's a, there is a page on it that kind of goes into it. And if you ever want a campaign that is centered around the Couch of our Helix, this is a really cool one. Uh, all of the stories about it all come from the second age of uh, Chaos and God Kings, and that's really where they're talking about Rabbik of Sta'abri and these other people uh, from here. So Evandale does have a very rich history of language, of cultures, and civilizations, and, uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but if you ever want to know more, uh, you can contact me right through the World of Evandale Facebook page. You can contact us through the, uh, through the YouTube channel. Just search for Evandale, E-V-I-N-D-A-L-E. As soon as we get 100 subscribers, we'll actually change the name to be YouTube slash uh, dot com slash Evandale instead of this long, extensive alphanumeric thing that it is now. Um, we continue to hope it, uh, that it grows and that if you guys really like Evandale, like the page, watch us up on, uh, up on YouTube. Uh, write uh, questions uh, about the world if you'd like to use it in your own, uh, in your own, um, as your own setting. I'd love to help you uh, develop uh, campaigns on it, um, or just to answer any basic questions or really any question about it that you may want. Uh, the more interest we see, the more I will continue to create the Atlas of Evandale, which will eventually be released. Uh, the Evan, the website EvandaleRPG.com is really just there to. Uh, uh, as kind of a teaser, I want to find out if people are truly interested. If you guys want to see a real atlas of the world, I've already started writing it in Scrivener. Um, it's looking pretty good. We have a lot of contributors over the course of time, all of the playtesters of, of the world itself. Um, and if you ever want to get involved in this uh, whatsoever, please let us know. I would love to help you. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for hanging in there. If you managed to watch this this entire time for a full hour and a half, thank you so much. Um, next week, we start talking about the countries. I can't wait for that because that's really when we start getting into the meat of it. And that's really when we start seeing the conflicts. It's one thing to talk about religion. It's another thing to talk about religious conflict. So we're going to start getting into that in the countries episode. And so I will see you next week. Meantime, search up on YouTube. Tomorrow we tape uh, episode uh, 17 uh, of the, uh, the Chronicles of Evandale online. And um, that's it. Anyway, thank you so much, guys, for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.